Good Sunday morning, Church at the Red Door. Welcome. If this is your first time for joining us uh, on our Sunday morning broadcast, a special welcome to you as well. It's an honor to have all of you here with us this morning. One quick thing I just wanted to point out is I, I look at August as kind of the home stretch for the summer. We're coming down the home stretch, the end of summer. And that this time of the year can be somewhat up and down financially. So I just want to encourage you. If God puts it on your heart, we'd be grateful for any gift this month in support of our monthly operations. Enough said on that. All right, Pastor Jeff is going to be continuing his message on the kingdom bubble today. It's going to be part two. I know it's going to be a powerful message. He's going to talk about living for God inside the kingdom bubble. All right. Uh, so it's going to be amazing. So stand by for that. Also wanted to introduce to you today, Amy and Colin Matsko. And Amy and Colin are going to bring us a scripture reading today as part of Jeff's message. So let's welcome them as well. Uh, all right, I'm going to close up here with a quick prayer, opening in the service in a quick prayer. And then we're going to move on to worship. And once again, just thank you for joining us this morning as we look forward to receiving God's word today. Dear Heavenly Father, we come today with uh, hearts, Father, seeking you. We're thirst and hunger for your righteousness, Lord. We lift you up. We give you praise and honor. We welcome you this morning, Father. Lord, thank you for all those that you have brought to hear your word today. What a blessing it is for us. What a privilege it is, Lord, to have the opportunity to bring your word forward. And we pray right now for Pastor Jeff. We ask you to anoint him, Lord, that your word would go forth and accomplish what you desire to do today. What a privilege it is, Lord, to be part of this uh, service today. And we just pray a blessing over all of us today and all of those that are listening and all those that will listen to this message in the future. And we pray all of this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. All right, now please uh, join me as we move on into worship. Thank you. Hello, Church at the Red Door. Good to uh, be with you again. We're going to finish up this second part of this little series that was started on uh, a metaphor, a modern day parable, if you will. Uh, again, Jesus, as we talked about last week, does this all the time. Jesus took something that we can see in the natural world and said, well, it's kind of like the kingdom. You know, this is a little bit like the kingdom. Now, let me be clear, as I was last week, this is an imperfect metaphor, but it's one everybody's aware of, or at least most sports fans are aware of. Look, things got crazy. The NBA was uh, getting close to the completion of its season, and everybody was working towards you know, making the playoffs, and then everything's canceled. So what are they going to do? They're really going to start all over again, but how are they going to do that without everybody getting infected? They created a bubble. They did it in Orlando, Florida. They went to Disney World and uh, they set up camp there. They took over the hotels. They took over kind of everything and they're going to play out their season, a fixed number of games, get into the playoffs and uh, they've got all this amazing protocol that they're using to try to see you got to come into the bubble. It's clearly we're still in the United States. We're still in Orlando, a place of infection. But we have quarantined these guys, and there is clearly a separation, which is what we looked at, that Paul had, uh, in his second letter to the Corinthians, come out, be separate. And it's uh, so it's an imperfect metaphor, but it's still workable, and I think, I hope it will help you understand, or at least get a picture, a lasting picture, of, and ask yourself, from what we looked at last week, do I pass the test of even being in the bubble? And then this week, I want to get into what does it look like inside the bubble? And what does it look like outside the bubble? So first of all, what does it look like outside the bubble and what inside? Well, first of all, we need to know who is the boss of inside the bubble. Well, in fact, he's the creator of all things, but he is definitely the understood king of the bubble. You know, Hebrews chapter three, verse six, very clear. But Christ was faithful as a son over his house, think of the bubble, whose house we are if we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope firm until the end. In other words, Jesus, as we used to say as little kids, well, you're not the boss of me. Well, Jesus, what we do as a follower of Jesus, we, we come to Jesus and say, you are the boss of me. You're the king of the bubble in this sense. And again, I know these are kind of crude terms, but it helps, I think, in our understanding of what an unseen dimension looks like. So what does it look like outside the bubble? That's where I'm going to start. Uh, this, and, and this first topic, again, I've talked about this at various points in the church, at Church of the Red Door. 
Uh, and I will always talk about it. Because why? Because it, you, the cross doesn't make sense outside of the understanding that the wrath of God abides on those outside the bubble. That is not a popular, common, modern day conversation to have. That is just not. You think you people are crazy. You know, we're good people. You can be a wonderful person. You don't need Christianity to be a good person. You know, all these kinds of things. Well, in a in just in a comparative sense, you're probably right. You can be a reasonably world worldly speaking a good person. I've, I have some incredible friends that have rejected Jesus that I love dearly. And they're so kind and generous, oftentimes even more generous of those that are inside the bubble. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But you've got to understand, God loves us inside the bubble. I said it last week. I'll say it again. God loves those outside the bubble. He is able through the cross to deal with us differently once we come inside the bubble. Once we come into the kingdom, his dealings with us change. John Stott's great on this. His dealings with us change. He's able to deal with us as family. When we're outside the bubble, he still loves us as much as those inside the bubble, but he cannot deal with us the same. Why? Because of his hatred of sin. Why? Because of what sin does to his creation. And so we need to understand, the wrath of God abides on those outside the bubble. John 3, 36. Now, these, these are Jesus' words, not just mine. Look at what Jesus says. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. But he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but what? The wrath of God abides on him. So if we designate in our metaphor here, inside the bubble, those who have done what? Believed into Jesus, and as a natural result of believing, you obey him. What we do is when we come in through the cross, we say, again, you're the boss of me. <clears throat> I'm not the boss of me anymore. You're the boss of me. You're the king of this realm. And that's what the kingdom of heaven is. Number two, outside the bubble, not only does the wrath of God, well, uh, is on, but there's just every form of evil. I mean, I don't think this takes a lot of explanation. Look, I lived a long time outside the bubble. And I've even tried to escape quarantine at times inside the bubble. Go, gone back and revisited some of that with sin in my life that I've had at various points uh, that I just, you know, re dog returning to its vomit, like Peter said. It, it's awful. Every form of evil exists. 1 Thessalonians 5.22. Abstain from every form of evil. You, you don't be like the non-bubble people. Separate yourselves. Come out from, um, from their midst. That doesn't mean you can do that in your physical body. You may still be right there together with them at work. You may be playing golf, loving them, having dinner, all those kinds of things. But you have to understand that spiritually speaking, outside of Christ, and again, it's not a popular notion, but I'm not here to be popular. I'm here to try to take this word and announce the words of the gospel. And the gospel says the wrath of God abides, every form of evil abides, and God has set himself against. He loves the people outside the bubble, but he has to set himself against things that harm his creation. And if you're infected, you know, I, there's a, there is a beautiful analogy here because, you know, sometimes we're forced to um, mask. I have some good friends that won't get in the same room with us. Uh, I understand. It's like, it, it's this, their dealings with us are different now because of this need for quarantine. They still love us the same. They just, their dealings are different with us now. And it's a little bit the same. God so loved the world, not inside and outside the bubble, that he gave his only begotten son, right? So that's what we understand from John 3, 16. So every form of evil, and I don't think we need to go into it. It's pretty obvious. <clears throat> Disorder and chaos all over society. You know, Psalm 2, verse 1. Why are the nations in an uproar? Why are the people devising a vain thing? And this is in the context of the Messiah. Why? Because the nations are always in an uproar. Why? Because outside the bubble, chaos rules. Yes, God is sovereign and God invades and he orchestrates his plans, but there is still utter chaos for those in rebellion to God. It's just the way it goes. Chaos reigns. 
North Korea emerges, all the strife that we have in the United States, through the Western countries and the Middle East. I mean, there's nowhere you can go. Go to Venezuela, go to South America, go up. I mean, it doesn't matter. There's always chaos, ruling, disunity, disorder outside the bubble. And there's relational chaos. Listen to Galatians chapter 5. I mean, we know this to be true. I mean, just look at reality TV. I mean, you don't have... I mean, I, I guess it's a cheap form of entertainment for people because now reality, reality TV seems to just dominate the airwaves. And this is just this. This is the picture of what uh, outside the bubble looks like. It's flesh-driven stuff. Paul says it very clearly. The deeds of the flesh, outside the bubble, if you will, are evident. Immorality, impurity, sensuality, sexual sin, idolatry, sorcery, now catch this, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, that's relational chaos. <clears throat> the workplace, you know, outside of a Christ-driven workplace. People claw over one another, get ahead, backbite, talk, of each other, talk about each other behind their backs, triangulate, I'm going to talk to this person about that person, when I'm with that person, I'll talk about that person. It's just relational chaos. Factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like this, which I forewarn you, just as I forewarned you, that those who, and we talked about this last week as one of the tests, those who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I would say as a follower of Jesus, clearly I have engaged in these, this kind of nonsense even as a follower of Jesus, but my conscience would prick me or God would move on me and then there would be repentance, and I'm constantly in the process of going back to those red heifer's ashes, if you will, symbolically, and being purified through the washing of the water of the word and through confession and all those kinds of things. But it's not a settled disposition. I remove myself from that, and I continue to go back to quarantine and move back into the bubble. I don't practice it. I don't stay in that state. For long periods of time. In fact, it's my ambition to be completely free from all this nonsense. That's the attitude of the bubble people, if you will. Self-reliance is found outside the bubble. Listen to Paul here. This is important because I've had some conversations about self-reliance and a lot of people think, you know, God loves those, you know, God helps those who help themselves and all that. It's just not Bible. The Bible's clear about self-reliance. We have to defeat self-reliance. If you've got nothing else out of this, my teaching, preaching for the last couple of years, self-reliance is the death knell for death knell for, for people who are trying to be kingdom people. <clears throat> we want to inquire of the Lord. Remember the story of David and all those other kinds. Of, listen to his letter to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9, and then 3, verse 5. I'll put them together. Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves, Paul's saying, so that we would not trust in ourselves. So we wouldn't be self-reliant, self-made men, self, self at the center of that. But in God who raises the dead. And then verse 5 from chapter 3. Not that we're adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. We're not relying on ourselves, not, in the, not inside the bubble. Now, outside the bubble, people are self-made. They, and they, you know, and they just, there's a lot of, pomposity and beating our chests and all that kind of thing. Self-reliant, that's outside the bubble. That is not kingdom dynamics. It's not. Now, what else goes on outside the bubble? Well, religious people, as I said last week, you can find all kinds of religious people outside the bubble. We looked at Matthew chapter 7. Many will come to me on that day and talk about all the religious activity that they were engaged in. And Jesus will say, well, I, I never knew you. I was never the boss of you. You were the boss of you. Religious people who are the boss of themselves are some of the most difficult to deal with individuals I've ever seen. They don't walk in humility, and we see that all over the place. Luke 14, verse 10, they're always fighting for, for attention and, and all that. Jesus says, when you're invited, go and recline at the last place so that when one is invited, you comes, he may say to you, friend, move up here higher. Then you will have honor in the sight of all who are at the table with you. Religious people look for the seat of attention. They go straight to the head of the class. They, they're fighting for attention. That's, that's the religiosity. And that's also 
A lot of that's self-reliant, motivational. Their motivations are manipulative and their tactics are deceitful. Religious people can do that. And a lot of people outside the bubble look at other people outside the bubble thinking that they're the Jesus people because they may carry the moniker of Christian when in fact they may be looking at people that just like themselves are spiritually dead. What else, look, what does it look like outside the bubble? Well, it's just prayerlessness, obviously. Now, some people throw up a prayer and every once in a while to an unknown deity. If you're out there, God, that's kind of the atheist prayer. You know, where we find prayerlessness, the, the most poignant first moment of prayerlessness is when Adam and Eve, in, in the first three chapters of the Bible, when they fail, in chapter three specifically, when they fail, what do they do? They, they run, they make excuses, they hide, they deny everything, but we never got any indication that they talked to God. They'd been, that was part of who they were. They were people who talked to God daily in the garden. And now nothing, silence, running, hiding, denial. That's what outside the bubble people look like. They're in denial maybe of God's existence. Maybe they've gone to that place in their own mind. Or they believe in God somehow, but they keep themselves far away. They hide from God. They run from God. And there are many excuses by which they do this. It's to their detriment. That's what outside the Bible activity looks like. Running, hiding, excuses. In the end, there's just no appetite, no real appetite for permanence. You know, we've looked at this many times. Second Corinthians chapter four, we don't look at the things which are seen outside the bubble stuff. We look at the things which are not seen inside the bubble stuff. For the things which are seen, they're temporal, but the things that are not seen, well, they are eternal. Inside the bubble, people are concerned about permanence, as we'll see in a minute. Outside the bubble, people, uh, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. There's a real sense in which I've got to grab everything now. It's about my rights and my, my activity under the sun. Everything's about my life. And they don't think beyond this life. All these are pictures, clear pictures, of outside the bubble people and what that atmosphere looks like. So let's go back for a second and let's think about, well, what does inside the bubble look like anyway? What does that even begin to look like? Well, first of all, and important to say, and you've heard me teach on this many times, there is or should be inside the bubble, and there certainly is under the rule and reign of Christ, a culture of honor. Philippians 2, and I'm going to read this from the message. It's important that because I think I love what Eugene Peterson does here, and again, this is this is like commentary. I mean, don't. this is not a word-for-word -word thing. But listen to what he says. If you've gotten anything at all out of following Christ, if his love has made any difference in your life at all, uh, if being in a community of the Spirit, think of the bubble here, means anything to you, if, if you have a heart, if you care, then do me a favor. Agree with each other. Love each other. Be deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet-talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside. Help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. I love that. This is the very essence of a culture of honor. Considering others more important than yourselves. Outside the bubble, consider yourself more important than others. And whether you say that or not, your activities are a demonstration of whether or not that's the attitude that you hold. Uh, that's just the reality of it. Now, inside the bubble, again, we're going to briefly go through this. This is going to be a, a, a very, and we'll, we'll do this someday. Uh, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. The least in the kingdom are the greatest. It's the way it works. Jesus saw the crowds, verse 1 in Matthew 5, and he went up to the mountain and he sat down and his disciples came. And he opened his mouth and he began, he began to teach. And this is what he was saying. Blessed, blessed. You're in a great position. You're in a position to receive. Uh, you're, you're, you're a favored one. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
<clears throat> poor in spirit? Well, at least a recognition of their poverty of spirit because now they're open to something that's transformative. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. If you're unhappy outside the bubble and you're mourning, you're in a great position. Just like we saw last week, like the prostitutes and the tax collectors, much mourning, their conscience is killing them. They can't take it outside the bubble anymore. If you've gotten to that place, if you're in a place where I love my life, everything's perfect, I don't need God, I don't need any of this, I'm happy where I am, and you're content outside that, and you're not someone who's mourned, let me tell you something. You may think, well, that's where you should be, but let me tell you, that's in a place of great danger. And the, Jesus' teaching would say, that is not a blessed place to be. Blessed are those who mourn. For theirs, what? They will be comforted. Blessed are the gentle. They're the ones that are going to inherit the earth. It's the least. It's a picture of the least. The mourners, the, the least, the gentle. I mean, we step all over the gentle outside the bubble. Inside the bubble, they're honored. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They're going to be satisfied. That's not outside the bubble stuff. That's not hungering and thirsting. Now, they may hunger and thirst for it, but they have no understanding of how it's arrived at through the blood of Jesus. Blessed are the merciful, for they'll receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, they'll see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, they'll be called sons of God. Blessed are those who've been persecuted. We'll talk about that in a minute. For righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil because of you. Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great for in the same way they persecuted the prophets. So inside the bubble behavior, the least of the greatest will be persecuted by people outside the bubble. Now remember, inside the bubble, we don't just remove ourselves. <clears throat> we can't physically remove ourselves. Just like the NBA bubble, they can't leave the earth and go up to Mars and play these games. They're still right in the middle of it with their physical bodies. There's a separateness and also an engagement, and it's just the way it has to be. I tell you what else, this is for sure. The truly religious aren't striving for attention, and they are not pictures of necessarily a visible success. 2 Corinthians 5, 9, Therefore we have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing. Inside the bubble, they're not looking for attention. They have one person, one creator is the creator that they want to please. Paul says it. I make it my ambition to be pleasing to him. If I was trying to please men, I'd, I wouldn't be doing this. I'm trying to please the creator of the universe. And then Matthew 6, listen, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. They love to stand and pray in the synagogues and the street corners and they, so that they may be seen by men. That's that religious activity. They have their reward in full, but when you pray, go into your inner room and close your door and pray to your father. Do it in secret. And your father who sees it, what is done in secret, well, he will reward you. See, inside the bubble, we're not looking to impress others. We're looking to impress him. When we pray, we don't have to stand on the street corners and pray and let everybody hear our long prayers. In fact, we're not even praying to God. We're praying so other people can hear what we're praying and we try to make them all flowery and fancy. At the end of the day, it doesn't work and it does not define inside the bubble people. Now we looked at this also, self-reliance outside, no reliance on the self inside the bubble. Spirit reliance, Holy Spirit reliance. Romans 4, 8, 14, listen to what it says. For all who are being led by the Spirit, now these are the sons of God. Are you being led by the Spirit? Inside the bubble people where they say, Jesus, you're the boss of me, they are utterly dependent, not self-reliant, dependent, dependent. And of course, prayer. Why prayer inside the bubble? Why pray? Well, they realize that's how you get things done. It's not just by self-effort. It's by prayer and engagement with the Spirit, allowing God then to get you on the same page that He's on so He can accomplish His purposes unique to, many times, your own imagination. Now, sometimes God puts thoughts in our heads and then envision, and we get it, and we go with it, and it is Him. But very often, we have our own vain imaginations, and we try to accomplish things inside the bubble that aren't even things that are Jesus is calling us to do. That's why 
I tell people all the time in counseling, the only unassailable counsel I can give you is do what the Holy Spirit's telling you to do. Now, I can give you biblical counsel. I can, if it's something that's a very clear, but most things counseling-wise are not as clear. Yeah, it, if it's clear, it's clear. A lot of things are in that gray area. Do you start a business? Do you not? Do you do, you do this or do that? I mean, a lot of things are very dependent upon being Spirit-led. Inside the bubble people, they only do what the Spirit tells them to do. Jesus, again, making that same comment. We've looked at that before. Jesus said, I only do what I see the Father doing. He was utterly dependent on prayer. And we see that through the selection of the disciples and many of the things Jesus was always away praying. John 15, verse 16, you did not choose me, Jesus says, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. Inside the bubble, when you're completely on the same page as Jesus and you're doing exactly what he tells you to do, he initiates prayer in your own heart. So you're praying something that he wants you already to do. And of course, he's going to fulfill that every time. People take this out of context and, and they take their outside the bubble ideas and uh, imaginations about things they want and things like that. And what happens? Well, they go outside the bubble and then they bring those desires inside the bubble and they pray. They apply John 15, 16 and they say, what happened? What happened here? God didn't answer that. He said it. If I, we prayed, he would answer the prayer. They're not people of deep prayer. If they were people of deep prayer inside the bubble, then they would understand exactly what God wanted, and they'd just be praying what God's already put on their hearts. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. That's what inside the bubble prayer life looks like. Psalm 5, 3, in the morning, O Lord, you will hear my voice. In the morning, I will order my prayer to you and I will then eagerly watch as you execute on everything that you've already worked in and through me. It is awesome. You know, there's some things that I'm praying for right now and I believe that they're God's will. I believe that he put them on my heart individually and I believe with all my heart there are some things that God is right around the, right around the corner from answering in your own life. Continue to ask. Continue to seek. And if it's in complicity with his will, everything's open. And that's what an inside the bubble person is. They're on the same page as the creator of the universe. We're actively engaged in battle. You know, it sounds like, oh, there's no chaos. Relational chaos is reduced. There's no uproar of the nations. There's, I mean, what a beautiful place to be. And yet, there's a battle raging. We know that. Ephesians 6 our struggle inside the bubble is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and powers, against the world forces of darkness, spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. We know there's a battle raging, certainly outside the bubble, but also inside the bubble. But our battle is not against the people outside the bubble. It's against the forces that dominate outside the bubble. Those forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Now, as a result of that, inside the bubble, persecution. Jesus even said it, you know? Those who cast insults at you, pray for them, persecute when you're persecuted for my name. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.12, very clearly. All who desire a godly life in Christ Jesus, living in the bubble, will be persecuted. I told you, I said, you're going to be surprised. Last week I said, you're going to be surprised maybe by some of the some of the attributes and what the atmosphere looks like. It's beautiful. It's unified in many ways. It's glorious. It's redeemed. There's no fear of death. All these things are true inside the bubble, but there's still active persecution. People still are passing away. People still are being insulted, and there's a battle raging, and, you know, all these things are true in the, bu in the bubble. Let me tell you something. That may not be that appetizing, but outside the bubble, mm, I, I do not want to go back there ever. So is there a sense of peace inside the bubble? Absolutely. But it's accompanied by persecution and struggle just as well as it is outside the bubble. But we know that we have the ultimate victory. And then lastly, and I'm going to have uh, Colin and Amy. I'm so, let me just tell you, I am, I heard this. I hope it's not true, but I've heard it is that Colin and Amy uh, are going to be leaving us and moving back near uh, Amy's parents in Florida. And uh, before they leave, I would like for them to read, because I, I want to talk to you a little bit in closing here, about permanence. 
about permanence. And I'm going to have them read from Hebrews chapter 11. Colin and Amy, we're going to miss you too when you leave. We've loved having you the short time that we've had you here at Church of the Red Door. We hope you're still CRD people in heart as you go to Florida. But, uh, and I don't know exactly when that is, but would you mind uh, reading Hebrews 11, 13 through 16? Hi, CRD. I'm Amy Matsko. And I'm Colin Matsko. We're going to be reading from Hebrews 11, 13 through 16. All these died in faith, without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance, and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Back to you, Jeff. Thanks, Colin and Amy. Uh, do you see that? I mean, do you see the appetite for the permanent? See what pervades the inside the bubble people. This kingdom, this unseen kingdom where Jesus is the boss of everybody inside the bubble. What you see is no longer an appetite to go back outside the bubble. It's an appetite for the permanent. They're seeking a city that has foundations. They, they're, in a sense, there's a nomadic kind of feeling to it. There's a, this world is impermanent. But I'm part of a kingdom, I'm part of a realm that is permanent. And that's what we are seeking. I love that. Death is no longer the ultimate challenge. It is, in fact, something we'll all go through, but there's no fear. It's been broken. I cannot even begin to experience. I go all the way back to when I was in junior high. And I remember walking a little aisle and giving my life to Jesus. Oh, I've had many struggles since then, got baptized and maybe even felt like I came to Christ much later. But I will never forget that moment I walked that aisle as a young man. And I had always kind of had this dark cloud and I just had no fear of death anymore. I didn't fear falling off my bike and falling off some hill or and losing my life. There was none and I have to this day never feared death again. And I walk and I engage with people all the time and they're terrified of death. I have zero, zero fear of death. Why? Because I realize the permanent nature of my soul and my spirit now having been eternally secured in Christ because of what he did with the cross. No wrath abides on me anymore. So uh, that's a little bit of the picture of this now very uh, uh, overdone maybe, this metaphor for these sports bubbles that were existing in and around. And I want you to see something. I want to make this last statement in closing. And it's important to say, you've got to understand that we, though we may seem like a sequestered quarantine community that's kind of, you know, dull and we just want to get back to our families and all that kind of thing, that's where the metaphor breaks down. But I, where it does not break down is this. You know, the Bible says that we are to be a city set on a hill. Again, Matthew 5, verse 14. Jesus speaking, you are the light of the world. Okay, this bubble, this picture of this bubble. So now I actually picture a big glass dome, if you will, over the, like a, like a, almost a literal bubble. Okay, a city on a hill. Think, think bubble here. It cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but, the lamp, and, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So, you know, when, this, uh, when these bubbles emerged and, and people were so hungry, like I want real sports, you know, as, as Laura would say. I want something real. I want something new and fresh. I don't care if there's no crowd and people are going crazy. Just watching them play golf on Sunday and coming down the stretch or play an MLB game or a soccer game or whatever your sport is. Just get it on the field again. And what happens? The media are part of the essential workers. And what do they do? They broadcast it all over the world. I mean, we, if you've got cable or even not, you get whatever your hookup is, you, this is being broadcast for all the world to see. It's a sequestered little city that has come out of the world, a different atmosphere, a different culture. Everything's different. 
but they're still broadcasting these games all over the world. Well, in, in the same way, God has called us to be a city on a hill, not a city that we move off into some remote part of uh, Alaska and we try to just create a commune and to have nothing to do. That is not at all. In this sense, we are to broadcast, allow the world to see a wealth, a, a properly functioning, humble, beautiful culture of honor that is the very community that Jesus created, not a religious hoity-toity, attention-grabbing, religious protocol-based community, a loving, gracious, and by gracious, I mean grace-filled community, and then put it on a hill. Let your bubble shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify the Father who's in heaven. So uh, I hope this has been helpful. Uh, I, I know things like this. I remember people telling stories. I, Jesus tells a story. I'll never forget the sower went out to sow. I know the weeds and the this and that. I'll never forget. I hear, I remember stories. I hope this gives you a picture and not an improper one because there's, again, like I said, it's not a perfect metaphor, but I hope this has given you a proper picture that will help you know how to function well inside the bubble and then, as importantly, how to reach back out to people outside the bubble with the gracious, gracious invitation of the gospel. Hope this has been helpful. We love you. Let me close in prayer. Father, I thank you. I thank you so much for today. I thank you for the privilege of being able to open your word and, and prayerfully get to the very heartbeat of the, of the message of the Bible. Jesus Christ crucified, the new boss of the bubble. And Lord, that entry is being made to anybody who would believe by faith. You don't have to hit 350 yard drives or be able to dunk a basketball to get in this bubble. You just need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you've never done that, you can do that right now. Lord, forgive me of my sins. Just pray after me. Lord, forgive me of my sins. I'm part of the outside the bubble people and I, I, I'm asking you to forgive me. I've been engaged in every form of evil. I have denied you. I have hidden from you. I have run from you for years. It's that time is over. I choose that. I choose you. You be the boss of me. And I will just tell you based on the full authority of scripture that if you prayed that, make it public, be part of a thriving community wherever you are and enter the bubble. All right, love you. Hope this has been helpful. Can't wait to see you face to face. Uh, we love you here at Church of the Red Door. Have a wonderful and grace-filled day.